Hi, in this session, we're going to be talking about psychiatric interviewing, and I apologize, this will be a bit longer than five minutes. Sorry, we have a lot to cover. The psychiatric interview is comprised of three parts. One is history of present illness, two is their life story, and the third is mental status exam. The most important rule in interviewing, no matter what specialty, is to ask open-ended questions. And open-ended questions are questions that do not have yes or no as an answer. You should ask open-ended questions because they're more efficient. And you may say, how can that be more efficient? And the answer is, rather than you spending all afternoon guessing, is it this, what about that, what about this, you have this, what about that, you just say, what's wrong? And one way of thinking about it is that your job is not to find out what's wrong, but rather your job is to get the patient to tell you what's wrong. And so open-ended questions are the key. Now. In the first part, the history of present illness, what you do in the very beginning is ask in a very open way, what brought you here, or how can I help you? And um, you give them three minutes to describe what's been going on. You will feel the urge to jump in and ask, to try to get it, to try to get the answer, try to get the diagnosis. Hold yourself back. Give them three minutes to describe what's going on. During that three minutes, you do two things. One, you do the nonverbal part of the mental status exam. What's their speech, appearance, affect, insight, judgment, etc. Anything that will give you a clue about what's going on. The second thing you do is accumulate a problem list. When you say, what brought you here? Patients will often say things like, you know, I don't know, I've been depressed. And my wife says I drink too much. Um, so in your head, you're accumulating depression, alcohol. And so you say, tell me more about that, and you accumulate the problem list. Once you're sure you have the problem list down, which will take a few minutes, remember, give them three minutes, then you move on and go through the diagnostic criteria for each problem. You say, okay, you told me you were depressed, tell me about that. Now, when you ask about the Siggy Caps questions or the DSM-5 criteria for any disorder, ask in an open-ended way. You don't say, do you have early morning awakening? Have you had greater than seven pound weight loss? You say, tell me about your sleep. How have you been eating? How's your energy level, etc." When you're done with that uh, diagnosis, move on to the next one. Your wife says, you drink too much. Tell me about that. How much do you drink? Have you had periods of abstinence? Has alcohol caused you trouble with relationships, with money, with your health? Have you had associated drug use with other disorders? In other words, go through the diagnostic criteria for each one. The second cardinal rule, the first one is to ask open-ended questions. The second cardinal rule is to ask what you know, then move on to the next thing. A trick is that when you're done with the interview, you say, oh, you know, we've been talking for a long time. Let me give you a break, and I'll come back in a few minutes. Then you run to the computer, look up DSM-5 or up to date or whatever reference, and you look at what diagnostic criteria you got. I got that one, that one, uh, missed that one, got that one, uh, missed that one, missed that one. And then run back to the patient and say, just wanted to check on how you're doing. And oh, by the way, let me ask you about. And that's a good general rule for psychiatry or any specialty. So ask what you know, and then move on. Now you know what's wrong. You have this your present illness, you have diagnostic hypotheses, which you've supported by obtaining data. Remember, diagnoses are built, they're not picked. So now you move on to the second part of the interview, and that's the life story. The life story is accumulating, accumulating information about somebody's life, and you look for themes, that is, things that happen, the same thing that happens in different points in their life, different times, different people. If the same thing happens over and over again, the only thing similar in all that is them. And I'll give you a mnemonic on how to put this together in a minute. But you obtain the information by going chronologically down their life. First of all, starting with the family, where we all start. Anybody in your family have any psychiatric disorder or substance use disorder. Then, what was it like growing up in your family? And the answer to that is always important. Um, then, you ask about relationships with people. Then, school. What was that like? Now, in child psychiatry, we focus on early development in the first grade or two of school. In adult psychiatry, we focus on high school. That is the transition from childhood to adulthood. And we say, what was that like? What did you like to do? How did you perform in school? What grades did you get? How far did you go in school? Then, 
ask, what did you do next? If they talk about jobs, talk about what jobs they had, and are they now working? What's the longest job they've had? Um, and how do they perform? Do they progress in their work? If they're not now working, when was the last time they worked? Then relationships. Husband, wife, children. Are you now in a relationship or what's the longest relationship you've had? Again, as a measure of stability. Somewhere along the line, wherever it makes sense, you have to ask about abuse, verbal, physical, or sexual abuse. Most of the patients who are admitted to an inpatient facility have had the experience of abuse. Certainly most women and, you know, a good chunk of men have had, in, have had sexual abuse in their past. So it's important to ask about that. In the first interview, you don't have to go into great depth, but get an idea wherever it's a good idea. If they talk about it growing up, if they talk about it in the military, if they talk about it in relationships, wherever they talk about it, make sure you cover it and say, I'm sorry you went through that. So you talk about jobs, relationships, and legal history. Have you ever been arrested? Have you ever spent time in jail? So what's a mnemonic for organizing the life story? The mnemonic is when Freud was asked what is health, he said it's the ability to work and to love, which is nice. So what we do is we look for the ability to work and to love. Remember, diagnoses are built, they're not picked, and so in terms of their ability to work, you've been gathering data on performance, Genetics, I'm putting there because I don't know where else to put it. Genetics, their ability to work in school, their ability to work at jobs, if they're a veteran or if it's at the VA, their ability to work in the military, which gives you another social setting to examine. Then their ability to love, we look at relationships growing up, their relationships at school, relationships at work, most importantly, love relationship, boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, how do they get along with them? And then your relationship with them. What do you feel about this person? And you will feel good, you will feel bad. Just so you know you should feel. We don't worry about you if you feel bad about a patient. We worry about you if you don't feel. Um, so what you feel is an important piece of information. Just so you know, patients will treat you the way they treat people. The fancy word for that is transference. So they will treat you the way they treat people and that will give you a diagnostic hint on how they do. So personality disorders, just so you know, we look for their ability to manage life. Do they have chronic maladaptive behavior patterns? And looking at their ability to work and their ability to love will tell you if they have trouble, do they have a personality disorder? The type of personality disorder, you can worry about that later. Know also that people do what they do. They are who they are. If things are going okay, and then they're not, that's what we call a life break. And for example, something happened there. Could be schizophrenia, could be the cocaine, but something happened there. But in general, people are the way they are. They'll do what they do. I'm not talking about the cause, just what they are. Then you ask medical history, and you don't have to do a full 14-point review of systems, but you should cover um, general medical things. What medical problems have you had? What pills? What allergies? If they say, oh, oh, I'm fine, then do a brief review. Headaches, eye trouble, do you have any trouble swallowing, GI trouble, thyroid, heart, lung trouble, any trouble with peeing, any trouble with your joints, just to go through. And my belief is that every patient should be asked about head injury. The screening question is, have you ever been knocked out? If they lost consciousness for less than a half hour, that's a mild head injury, which is 85% of all head injuries. If it's between a half hour and a day, that's a moderate 10%. If they've been out for more than a day, that's a severe head injury. The reason that's everybody is that head injury is a real risk factor for all psychiatric disorder. And people with substance use, most of them, when they come to see you, will have had a head injury. So take count of the number of head injuries and the severity, how long have they been out. Then there's psychiatric disorder. Ask, have you ever had treatment before? Inpatient treatment, outpatient treatment. What was helpful? And always do what was helpful. For pills, if they say, you know, venlafaxine was helpful, but Zoloft and Prozac, that never helped. Then you know what to do. Always go downhill. Always do what worked. In terms of psychotherapy, if somebody says, I just needed a chance to get it off my chest, interpersonal psychotherapy would be helpful. If they say, I went and the guy just stared at me then um, CBT is the way to go.
So remember, always go downhill, do what was helpful. Third part of the, the exam is the mental status exam. The mental status exam has two parts. One is the nonverbal stuff, the stuff you observe, which you've already done. Their appearance, speech, affect, insight, judgment, gauge of their intelligence, etc. You've already done. You should ask cognitive questions, mood questions, psychotic questions, anxiety questions. Start with cognitive questions and say, I'm going to ask you to remember three words, three unrelated nouns, and at the end of the interview, you ask what those nouns were. Then you should do orientation. What's today's date? What's the name of this place? I don't ask them their name because it's just rude if you've been talking to somebody for a half hour, say, uh, what's your name? Um, so orientation questions, move on to some measure of attention. Classically, that is serial sevens or spelling the word forward then backward. You don't have to do both. If they can't do one, you just register what they did. Then mood. What is your mood like now? Remember their mood is what they describe it as being now. And then you should Always, 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 always ask about suicidal ideation and homicidal ideation. If they have ideation of thoughts of hurting themselves, ask about intent. If they have intent, do they have a plan on how they would do it? If they have a plan, have they taken any steps to carry it out? And do they have any history of past suicide attempts, which is the biggest risk factor? Generally, we admit if somebody has intent to harm themselves. And you can ask the same thing about homicidal ideation. Then you move on to the psychotic questions. Do they have hallucinations or delusions? And the most common hallucinations are auditory or visual hallucinations. Ask if they've been hearing things where they can't see people or see things that aren't there. And delusions, the most common delusion is paranoid delusions. You feel like anybody's trying to harm you or do something to you. Then anxiety questions are obsessions, compulsions, phobias. Um, and remember, um, that's not as common in inpatient settings. But obsessions, any worries you worry about over and over again any actions you feel like you have to do, and any fears you avoid. That's a mental status exam. Ah, but remember to ask those three words that you asked at the very beginning. So three parts, history of present illness, listen to them for three minutes, do the nonverbal part of the mental status exam, accumulate your problem list, do it one at a time, life story, look at their ability to work, their ability to love, medical psych history, remember to always ask about abuse, head injury, mental status exam, cognitive questions, mood questions, psychotic questions, anxiety questions. And look at the session on treatment planning. That'll be less than this one, shorter. Have fun talking to people, though.